Well, Isabel, thank you. Welcome. Um, I just kind of, out on a whim, just kind of thought I'd see if I invite you. I noticed you were you were involved with a paper that I thought was quite interesting, and so I think it was it, it lends itself to talking to. Can you introduce yourself, if you don't mind? Yeah, I assume you're in the UK, and uh, can tell us a little bit about your background and stuff. I am actually right now in Dubai. I fly back to the UK tomorrow. That's actually where I'm based. Um, and uh, so, okay, about myself. So I'm a biochemist and I'm doing, uh, I'm a PhD researcher. Um, my research is in hyperinsulinemia and ketogenic sciences in both. And um, so I do work with obviously people who have pathologies and I work with people who are very, very, very healthy as well. Um, one of the things that I was really curious about um, was that we have a lot of research that goes on in people who turned to ketogenic diets or low carbohydrate diets having come from some sort of metabolic ill health of some sort um, and in actual fact there tends to be not so much research in people who actually generally are actually very low carb and likely to be in ketosis much more than they realize even um, and even though there is a lot of research in high performance athletes who are low carb I wouldn't say that the average person in the population is a high performance athlete as well. And so they're, they're also sort of a unique subset. And so I sort of really felt that um, a lot of the reference ranges that we look at in people, um, they're really not really sort of the ideal reference ranges. They're more of what's what I wouldn't call normal, but common more than anything else. And we know in systems biology that, you know, you sum up a bunch of things together and you get, this output and then you you know you tweak and change a little thing and then you get a different output and i kind of sort of started to see this in in reference ranges in 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 biomarkers and things like that um and so i felt there was a huge lack in in that area of research um so that's why i sort of in within my phd research i wanted to study people who have not had a metabolic illness who by choice in life have gone low carb um just because they like it. It's a preference in actual fact. And uh, when I say low carb, it may not be as low carb as people who have had metabolic syndromes and conditions that they have to go really low carb because in actual fact, people who haven't really had any um, health conditions, their carbohydrate allowance intake is um, at more, you know, they can, they can tolerate a lot more. Um, and so this is a, a sort of different area that, you know, I, they, but some people don't snack, they don't, you know, they tend to have larger gaps between meals, um, they exercise, but not to a high performance uh, athlete level. And so I, I study these people in, in a healthy population to sort of establish these kind of like their baselines, what are their biomarker baselines, and then their reactions to oral glucose tolerance tests over five hours with insulin assay and ketone assay. And then I've collected quite a lot of um, plasma from these participants so that I can then do uh, further work, which is cell stimulation work um, with different kinds of uh, primary cells and um, immortalized human cells and uh, uh, animal cells so that we've got them to be able to compare to existing researchers out there. Um, a little bit back on my background is that I, I came to this world um, from quite a different direction, I would say, to most people. Um, I've never had a metabolic illness. I'm very, very healthy, thankfully. Um, and I'm 41, much to 42. And I came into studying the sciences quite late, actually. I originally studied the arts. I went to Central St. Martins in London, and then I had a career in the arts, things like that. And then I decided to come back uh, to studies and go back into the sciences. I have two young children, and you know, the decision making about what's the best thing for their health, for their long term health, uh, whether it's from just generally what do I cook and feed them to what are they exposed to, to medications and all these things. And I'm the sort of person who, um, I don't like sort of opinion books or magazines and, and, you know, you hear so many conflicting messages and I like knowing how things work at a basic level and to somewhat see it myself. And so um, a combination of other reasons in life brought me back to going back to studies. And originally I started studying nutrition and I saw that it was uh, sort of the repeat of the same old, same old, and it was a bit of a frustration, um, which is why I say when there's a big call for doctors to go, medical doctors to go back and study nutrition, the problem is if, if it's to go back and study 
the nutrition that's being taught, then it doesn't improve that system, unfortunately. Um, and so I then transferred over to study biochemistry to sort of approach things from a much more sort of first principle basis. You know, if I can try it, if I can test it and things like that. And yeah, that sort of led me along this way. Um, in terms of ketogenesis and low carbohydrate, I come from a very long background of uh, being a ballet dancer. And I danced at the Royal Academy in London. And um, then when I was at university, my first time around studying the arts, I also modeled. And in this combination of the two, it was kind of well known to not eat carbs. And so, you know, um, when I was working and all these things, it was just known in the industry, whether it was from ballet dancing or from modeling um, to not really eat carbs. Um, and so that, that was just something I sustained, which probably feeds into why I've never had a metabolic condition. Um, so, so I didn't come, come from it from that position. Um, and then uh, I also am part Hong Kong Chinese. And when I had my daughters, um, there's this practice that, that, that goes on in, when you have a child in Chinese culture. For 40 days, you essentially consume a ketogenic diet. And I didn't know the word ketogenic at that time um, with my first daughter. So you're, you're, you're given bone broths, a lot of bone broth, meat, eggs, and it's very fatty, fatty meat. Um, and the Chinese do place heavy emphasis on, on nutrient dense types of meats and, you know, organ meats and things like that. But, but even still, it was more the broth than anything else and a lot of eggs. And, um, I remember the second time I, when I had my second daughter, by then I was aware of, of this term ketogenic ketosis. And it was when I realized, I said, oh my gosh, this is, this is really ketogenic, you know? And, um, there's these sort of words that Chinese use, uh, Hong Kong Chinese, they use, um, one is when you have this diet after you have a baby, it's called cho um, yu and ko feng sa tong, which essentially means to, to avoid getting um, arthritis, which is really interesting. And, and so they knew that this would prevent you from having this hormonal imbalances and other things that would happen um, that happened because of pregnancy and that this would reset it all in 40 days. And um, it really was sort of a, it, it predominantly pork meat, um, although there's a lot of chicken as well. Uh, but when I say meat, it's really the fatty, fatty parts, in, including the feet and things like that. Um, and then obviously there's another practice that I grew up with. So my father was in the military and he was head of the medical, um, the medical office. And so followed Western traditions and my mother being Chinese followed Chinese traditions. And so uh, when we were unwell, which was quite rare, uh, my siblings and I, the Chinese practice is what they saw called gai hao. And it literally means stop at the mouth. So when you're unwell, the first thing you do is stop everything at the mouth. And then you don't eat, you, you actually fast and you go straight to broth only. And then the next thing is pork. And that's a sort of typical thing. So I, all of those things sort of add up together to sort of what made sense to me in the end. That's really fascinating, particularly the, uh, the early uh, maternal diet, you know, and, I, and my assumption is it's going to affect the breast milk. And uh, uh, we've seen studies that show that women eat different diets, have different fatty acid compositions within their breast milk. And that has an impact on uh, early you know, neonatal development, particularly ner nervous system development, because that's what the kids are doing. They're growing a big brain. And, I just wonder how widespread that is among among China and, and some of the neighboring countries, because when we look at across the board worldwide IQs, we always see that the Asian countries tend to have a slightly, you know, two, three point advantage over, say, the Western and Western countries and stuff. So does it have a role? Perhaps who knows? I mean, it's interesting mm -hmm. to think. Let me ask you about because um, you mentioned at the very beginning about redefining, you know, normal lab values versus optimal lab values. And I, and I see that there is this sort of we are basing our lab values primarily on, a, on a, what would generally be considered a sick population, and that's our, our spectrum of norms. So what, what specifically are you referring to when you say certain lab values or certain measures don't necessarily add up for, for different people? Can you, can you delve well, into that a little uh, bit? Yeah, I, um, one that was, you know, I saw in my pilot study, which I'm working towards now, uh, bringing up to a full, full uh, count of, of uh, participants, was the the I, I studied um, in my pilot study uh, p 
people who had sustained ketosis for no less than two years and they had no prior metabolic conditions and they were women and they they everything looked really really fantastic they had very very low t3 they were they, but you know when when we did the rq and we had a look at the respiratory quotient and all all the other things that they they obviously were incredible fat burners incredible fat burners um you know and if, if a doctor, a, a, a physician had seen this, they would have looked at it and said, oh my gosh, you're hypothyroid and, and start giving you medications for this. And so this is, a, this is the thing. Um, first of all, if we have a huge a growing population of people who are turning to low carbohydrate diets, um, they may end up having very low T3. And then you have, can have physicians misdiagnosing that and then treating it. Um, and the other thing is, is that, you know, uh, it's kind of logical because active T3 um, is a nuclear receptor activator. And so it increases the gene transcription for mitochondrial electron transport chain OXFOS enzymes. And so when you have a lot of damage, glycation, uh, not necessarily like ROS damage from, from excess carbohydrate consumption um, and insulin, you, you're going to have signals coming out from the cells and they're going to need um, more replenishment of the electron transport chain um, enzymes. And so this is really kind of a role for, for T3. And the thing is, is that not only do you get less damage to the electron transport chain when you reduce carbohydrates, what you also get is the um, beta hydroxybutyrate in itself upregulates the transcription of um, mitochondrial electron transport chain enzymes and, and also antioxidants that obviously protect them more. And so you have less requirement for T3 in actual fact. And so, you know, there's, I mean, there's still a lot we have to figure out, but this kind of happens in a lot of areas too. So just like, you know, you see with people who are in ketosis or very low carb um, or you know, rest, uh, time restricting their feeding. So they're not necessarily low carb, but they, they fast more, things like that. They, so that they, they do end up getting into ketosis. They, um, they tend to be, they tend to require less of a hormone that does more of the job. So sort of get more bang for their buck. And so, you know, I see things where people freak out about testosterone going lower as well. And then it's like, well, you know, you, maybe you don't need as much. That smaller amount does so much more instead. Um, and so there's a lot of things that we don't necessarily, I mean, testosterone can also go, go higher. Um, it, it, it's a combination of what your activities are and all these combinations. And of course, you know, uh, your age phase and your life and things like that. So there, there are all these things um, they're, that they're definitely different. And also with regards to response curves, like the OGTT, um, one of the things is that uh, I work, uh, I collaborate with a couple of other people, and one of them is Catherine Cross, who uh, studied the Cross data set. And one of the things I, I had seen is um, there was this sort of question mark. They didn't know which were the people who were low carb, who'd gone to eat carbohydrates for two weeks and then had their OGTs done. And um, in that sort of question, it was like they, there, was a, there was a sort of hypothesis that they would have a, a poor insulin response. They would have sort of like pattern five that would be somewhat maybe similar to, to type one diabetics. Um, but again, there's that problem with the people that they tell, told to go and eat carbohydrates to run those tests, were they type two diabetics? Were, had they had metabolic syndrome of some sort, hyperinsulinemia, or were they just people who were preferentially low carb anyway? And um, in my pilot study, having um, participants who had never never had a metabolic condition, hyperinsulinemia, um, they actually had the perfect response. They had a type, a pattern one response, which was a really healthy response. And then I had them come out, suppress ketosis for three weeks. So they literally followed the UK um, Eat Well guidelines and um, had them repeat the OGT. And again, they had a really healthy response as expected. They, they're very glucose tolerant. And uh, then they went back, they removed that intervention, which was follow, which was suppressing ketosis. Um, and then they returned perfectly back to their original position, which was really, really great to see. It showed, you know, metabolic flexibility, which is not necessarily the case for people who've suffered hyperinsulinemia for a long period of time. Um, but it was really interesting. And, and there's a few other sort of things that have to be, be worked out from it all because um, again, how we read things, if you looked at those graphs, you, you, we saw that the 
uh, glucose was much, it started much lower, but it went much higher and stayed much higher in the ketosis phases. Um, but they required less insulin to put that away, which is obviously um, a good sign in that respect. Although other people would look at it and go, oh my gosh, look, they had so much glucose coming out because their, their liver stopped produce, putting out that glucose. And, you know, um, but the, the thing is, is that it, there's a physiological adaptation. And I think that the word insulin resistance um, by itself is, can be quite misleading um, because if you are not consuming carbohydrates or you're doing long fasts, um, then essentially your body's relying on that glucose coming from your liver. I mean, it really is. And so you, you wouldn't want your liver to shut down uh, giving, out that in, giving out that glucose. And you wouldn't want it to shut down releasing fatty acids either. So, um, you know, in, 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 in that scenario of people who are low carb, um, and like I said, uh, people who've never had hyperinsulinemia, you should expect that the liver will keep producing, produce, giving out glucose. And you should expect to see that the liver will even put out fatty acids and continue in that respect. Because um, the body wouldn't obviously uh, be able to survive the, the insulin um, assault, uh, so to speak. So, and then there's another aspect, which is insulin. When you hear insulin resistance, it, it's misleading in the sense that you know, for example, with muscle cells, they may not take up glucose, but they still see the insulin. And so within the research world, there's a big problem because you get um, animal studies or cell studies where they either knock out the receptor or they, you know, they, they use small interference uh, RNA. They, they do things to block, make it so there's no receptor or make it so it, um, you know, it, it doesn't work in some way or another. Um, and the problem with that is that doesn't that doesn't produce a model that is insulin resistant that produces a type a kind of sort of type one diabetes version more than anything else because just because the cell's not taking up glucose doesn't mean it doesn't see that insulin because insulin does so so many other things um so it, it sensitizes cells to growth factor stimuli uh, signaling and in actual fact without insulin then growth factors wouldn't be affecting cells because the way that growth factor receptors are plugged into cell membranes is called phenylation or prenylation um this is mediated by insulin and so the insulin actually does this it mediates this this prenylation and so it's insulin obviously is doing a lot more than just glucose uptake. And within my work, I argue that if you take, um, so let's say historical man, so the phenotype one, um, historical man who, you know, often wouldn't eat for 15 hours and uh, wouldn't have year long access to carbohydrates, um, things like that. Uh, this person likely would be in ketosis actually quite a lot. And, um, it doesn't matter about the degree of ketosis at this point. If you haven't had any pathological health problems, it's, it's not a case, case of trying to achieve high ketone. ketones. I'm just talking here about, you know, anything of 0.1 on your home meter sort of thing. Um, this sort of person won't really need insulin to facilitate glucose uptake. And so I argue that insulin's primary job is not for uh, glucose uptake. Um, it, it's misconceived this way because of the pattern of eating in this day and age. But if you think about people who either only eat once a day or infrequently, or they eat very low carbohydrate, the cells that absolutely do depend on glucose, they don't need insulin to take up glucose at all. Um, and so the aspect of insulin making cells take up glucose is a, is a sort of emergency version really. It's, 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 so this is one thing that I argue in this. And then the, the reason why is I come to another part of research that I'm doing, which I, I'm doing with Kenneth Brookler and, and Catherine Cross is on bone metabolism. And in the bone metabolism area, we've been looking at um, bones being actually very, very actively involved in that whole sort of feedback circles of, of insulin, glucagon, uh, glycemia, and metabolic health and we realize that it's sort of a missing component because we only sort of think about bone in in very rudimentary ways one is you know supporting our physical structure holding muscles in place and some movement and the other is we only worry about osteoporosis and some storage of calcium and some minerals and we don't really think about 
in any, really any other way, when in actual fact, um, we've discovered that um, it, it, it's playing a role in metabolic hormonal regulation. And so um, it comes to a number of things. One, actually, uh, you were just mentioning about lactation and breastfeeding and, and children and their brain, brain health is that the bone cells, the osteocytes, they produce a hormone called osteocalcin. And this osteocalcin is actually higher in, in healthy people, in people who are metabolically healthy, non-hyperinsulinemics, and lower in people who are hyperinsulinemic. And unfortunately, a lot of the research studies, when they study osteocalcin, they study it in the concepts that um, you need osteocalcin to make insulin. And this is clearly not true because type 2 diabetics, cardiovascular disease patients, they, they have low osteocalcin and obviously they have higher insulin. So in the real world context, it's not true. And the unfortunate aspect of the research literature is because of these knockout studies that are confusing, you know, they, they mislead because the baseline premise of how they're designed is incorrect. So the interpretation ends up being wrong. Um, but what you do see is that osteocalcin has, has from, from the bone cells, which are specifically the osteocytes, um, they're doing some, a lot with regards to the metabol metabolism of the body. It's um, something that can pass through the blood brain barrier and um, can pass through the placenta and in breast milk. And um, it has quite a number of roles in a non hyperinsulinemic person. It does activate insulin secretion. It activates uh, GLP-1 as well. So you get glucagon um, uh, inhibition um, and you also get uh, signaling to the brain to inhibit um, eating, so you satiety, and it slows down gastric emptying as well. And so it has all these, these roles. Um, and then uh, it passes through the placenta, it passes through the placenta before the fetus can actually make osteocalcin in itself. And it stimulates neurogenesis, it stimulates hippocampal neurogenesis and avoidance of apoptosis and increases uh, in the grown person as well as in the fetus, um, dopamine and serotonin synthesis and modulates GABA synthesis. So these sort of things. Uh, and I, I think that it's, you know, we're, we're, we're only just moving into the world of let's measure glucagon as well to have a look at that ratio. But I actually think that osteocalcin is one that's um, not, being, not being paid attention, not being paid enough attention to at all. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, all, all the many, myriad of hormones we put out and, and uh, you know, these uh, uh, cytokines and, you know, the, the uh, different cellular communications, they all gonna, they're all going to interact with us. We, we, we're just scratching the surface, really. And it, I mean, you comment about the thyroid. I know Stephen Finney has written a little bit about, you know, the fact that we become thyroid sensitive, just like we become insulin sensitive and we may potentially become androgen or estrogen sensitive depending on the milieu so it's not just the hormone level it's the receptor interaction I, i've been saying that stuff for years and people think i'm nutty but anyway <laughs> let me ask you about um oh this is the thing because you talk about you know the non-insulin dependent uptake of glucose and obviously certain cells like red blood cells renal medulla parts of the brain my understanding is you know the muscle uh, cells you know the glute, the glute 4 receptor is primarily you know insulin it, it utilize, can utilize insulin, but I think there's, there's translocation of the glute four to the, the membrane just with exercise alone. And so there's a sort of a non-insulin dependent way of uptaking glucose via exercise. Mm. It, it, am, I, am I correct in, in, in mentioning that? Yes. I mean, at the end of the day, there, there is this sort of aspect of, uh, of when you utilize substrates, there's a concentration gradient, right? There's these drawdown concentration gradients, this, this aspect in itself. And there's always a background level of insulin in the background as well. In actual fact, when you exercise, you produce more osteocalcin and you release it out into the system. And osteocalcin sensitizes muscle cells to enhance glucose uptake. And so it's an insulin independent uh, enhancer of glucose, significant enhancer of glucose uptake. And then when you put that with insulin, it does it even more. And so you then require less insulin to be able to take up that glucose. Um, and, and, and again, it, it, it causes other things like it increases uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, it increases um, adiponectin uh, synthesis and uh, uncoupling proteins in white adipose tissue and brown adipose tissue. So you get more thermogenesis as well. Um, so you do have other things that sensitize the cell to, to glucose uptake in natural fact. And so this is why I was saying, if you're actually in a, in a fasted state or, you know, I, I say in a ketotic state, that doesn't necessarily mean you're following a ketogenic diet. Um, Cause obviously there's so many ways to be in ketosis. Um, 
but uh, in, in that sort of setting, you would produce more osteocalcin and release it more out into your system. And that sensitizes your muscle cells to glucose uptake by itself. And um, exercise in itself actually, uh, it, it causes this fluid uh, movement, fluid flow through the uh, lacuna canaliculi in the bones, and they signal with muscle cells, myocytes. So muscle cells, fat cells, and bone cells actually signal between each other and they release extracellular vesicles directly to signal each other as well. And uh, with this fluid flow um, that affect the osteocytes, they actually increase the synthesis of osteocalcin and release it out. And that's going to sensitize your, your muscles to take up glucose. Yeah, it's, it obviously gets more complicated the further you look at it. I'm sure it'll be 10 times more complicated in 10 more years as, as we go. Let me ask you, you mentioned something about the electron chan transport chain within the mitochondria and it being potentially damaged certain ways. How are you assessing that now? How do we, I mean, can, I mean we've got electron micro micro microscopy and, you know, we can look, we can see really small things now, but how do you functionally tell, hey, this mitochondria is sick, this, this electron transport chain is not working well. Can we assess it? What are the effects of a low carb or ketogenic state on those things? How do you, how do we know that's going on? So in the wet lab, it, it's, it's done quite well. So I guess uh, there's a question of how can someone who's not in a wet lab, who's not in a laboratory, make those kind of assessments? Because within wet lab research, we have a multitude of ways that we can do that. So we have fluorophores um, that are that are very good at, at tagging onto mitochondria they and they measure either the totality of mitochondrial membrane or inner membrane or they measure active um, membrane that has a redox potential that can that we can then see how active it is um, we also measure um, things that we measure sort of cardiolipin which is a fatty acid that's unique to the inner mitochondrial membrane uh, measuring obviously the enzymes inside um, and then products of the mitochondria so NADPH, um, reduced glutathione, particular enzymes that um, we, we know get increased in transcription uh, when the cell is healthier and they are localized to the mitochondria. So there's a lot of things that we can measure in the wet lab. Um, with regards to being at home, so to speak, how would you do it? I mean, this, I think, is much, uh, it's, it's, it's always proxy. It's not direct, really. I mean, there's nothing at home that can measure this. I, I mean, I've, I, I hear a lot of talk about learning the, the potential products that are going to come out to measure things like NAD+, um, but I think that they're just measuring what's free in the, in the, in the plasma of your blood. Um, so there are a few things. I mean, I think we're just we're too far away to be having products on the line for, for the public. But, you know, we are discovering there are, there are cellular free mitochondria in your plasma. This is very interesting in itself and they're respiratory competent as well. Um, now in my own research, when I do cellular work and plasma work and obviously measure things in participants, um, what I'm trying to find is when people are in ketosis, this is therefore what we see in their cells. And so it's a good way of sort of seeing that, that that's likely to be the case. And so my sort of fundamentals is if you are producing even a very small amount of ketones throughout the day. So, you know, the main one actually I would say is before your dinner hour, then you're not overproducing insulin. Um, it's within a range that's, that's not toxic for you, let's say. Um, and I'm not talking. So I'm not talking about you're in some level of therapeutic if you've had a hyperinsulinemia metabolic condition, but at the very least, you're you know you're in a range that is definitely not producing pathology. Um, and so then the work that I do in vitro, ex vivo, those sort of things, I use the human plasma that I collect and I stimulate these cells and have a look at these changes and quantify, you know, quantify rate of cell division, um, you know, harm the cells. So using things to, to cause distress um, to uh, certain chemicals that are known to harm, you know, complex one of the mitochondria, things like that, and pre-treating the cells in with uh, human ketosis plasma versus non-ketosis plasma, things like that. And then having a look at those kind of outcomes, because unfortunately, again, with in vitro work and ex vivo work, um, or a lot of the time these cells are cultured in, in media that is just 
not at all representative of, of human plasma and, and human phenotypes. And so I wanted to, although they have the necessity to give some basic ideas that we can work from, we have to be really, really careful because I mean, as far as I'm aware, there's no humans with bovine serum inside of us and things like that. So, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, in terms of measuring, I always say to people, the best thing is looking at your, if you produce a, a very small amount of ketones, I'm really saying just 0.1 on your meter, but it has to be later on in the day because most people will wake up with ketones in the morning. So it's a very misleading um, marker for, in the morning. Yeah, that's a, that's a good county out there. So that, that's good to see. I want to ask you, um, because there's a couple questions here, I want to make sure I try to get some of these answered if I can. Um, and this is, you know, this is one of the, I think, I just want to make sure I get to this topic because paper that I noticed was, was in, in context to infectious disease, viruses, particularly, I think the, the, the one we're dealing with now, the COVID-19. And you argue that, you know, hyperinsulinemia, you know, hyper uh, coagulable, coagulable states and so on and so forth are some of the major drivers of mor morbidity and mortality for people with disease. And then you make the argument that this can be mitigated through dietary interventions. Can you talk a little mm. bit about that paper and what prompted that? And, um, you know, more frustratingly for me, why isn't everyone talking about that instead of where all we hear is, you know, put on a mass social distance and there's not a peep about let's get healthy. Yes, but yes. I'm not sure what is, that, what, this, what, t t tell us about that paper. Yeah, this is uh, something that I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very frustrated with. I'm sure many people are very frustrated with, um, you know, we, we, we shouldn't rely on one mechanism to to deal with infectious diseases at all and so as much as there may have been you know uh, measures put in whatever those reasons are um in terms of you know social distancing quarantining masking uh, waiting for vaccines to be developed uh, there should have been a much larger larger focus on the baseline health of people i mean a lot of time has passed now and so i've become very frustrated with this myself um, it became very obvious at the very beginning that the risk, the, the, the groups of people who were at most risk um, were um, hyperinsulinemic people. At the end of the day, they, you had type 2 diabetes, you had overweight, you had elevated ferritin, elevated D-dimer, um, elevated HbA1c. And, you know, in that group was placed um, people over the age of 70. Um, and the reality is, is that it's not being over 70 that put people at risk. It was just that you, mo those, those who were vulnerable in the over 70s had just been hyperinsulinemic for that many more years and they were just that much more hyperinsulinemic. And my sort of background of studies was always insulin in, in a, at a disreg in a dysregulated situation and its role in all these aging related diseases that are no longer considered just old age diseases. I mean, we used to say adult onset diabetes. Now we don't say it. We don't say maturity onset because it's happening so much younger and Alzheimer's disease is happening so much younger. Certain cancers that are supposed to, supposed to happen very late in life are happening earlier and earlier and earlier. And so they're not really aging diseases really anymore they're just markers of, of dose and duration of hyperinsulinemia and what stimulates that hyperinsulinemia. And, um, you know, the leading causes of death being cardiovascular disease, cancer and dementia in different order in different regions of, of the world. Um, in America, I think it's cardiovascular disease is the leading. In uh, England and Wales, it's actually Alzheimer's disease. And in China, it's cancer. So there are differences there, it's sort of in competition, let's say, but they had this root, um, this, this common commonality, this root that's hyperinsulinemia, as far as the research that I've done, based on much research that I've obviously read. Um, and when looking at uh, COVID-19 and the risk factors, it became really clear um, those markers are the markers that are dysregulated in hyperinsulinemic people. And then, um, you know, I was working with Catherine and Ken as well, and we were discussing this a lot. Um, we, we had long meetings every week. And um, the, the thing is, is that I, I was thinking, I, I think at the mitochondrial level quite often, that's where, where I work a lot. And, you know, we were seeing elevated ferritin, we were seeing low oxygen, oxygen saturation capacity. And 
we always hear about hemoglobin A1C and glycation damage and these sort of things. And I was sort of thinking, of, you know, we were seeing in the news as well as published papers, um, uh, clotting and, and thromboembolism and things like that. And so I just got thinking about it and got thinking about um, deep vein thrombosis and, and uh, even um, altitude sickness and all these sort of things. And I, I sort of think, well, in the condition of hyperinsulinemia, these people who are hyperinsulinemic already are at such higher risk of coagulability. The, the, you know, it's very common, unfortunately, type two diabetics, cardiovascular disease, um, strokes, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, they have much, much higher rates of, of embolisms thrown by. And um, so if you are already at that higher risk, you're, you're at that edge, you just, it takes one little thing to push you that much further. And in the case of a respiratory, and, and not even just COVID-19, any respiratory infection is more likely to really knock you out. Um, and, and we see that if you just go back every year and you look at who are the people who are worst affected by respiratory infections, it, it is the same group of people who are worst affected. So, you know, and, and throughout the past you know, 100 years, we've had some respiratory infections that are certainly far worse than others. But the, the sort of pathogenesis and, and the physiology of who they harm, you can see this pattern. And so with regards to the, the um, respiratory system, if you have something that challenges, obviously, oxygen, oxygen demand, and you need healthy red blood cells, and you need healthy heme, and you need all of these um, things that are just part of a natural functioning system, forget about a respiratory uh, infection that challenges that system on top of it. Um, then hyperinsulinemia is going to negatively affect this already. And so um, this was quite obvious from the beginning. And then uh, just working out all those little mechanisms. So when you know that glucose causes glycation damage, when you know that it causes mitochondrial damage, because mitochondria is where heme is made. And so, of course, uh, if you're having more heme damage, you need more heme synthesis. And the problem is, is that heme synthesis in and on itself increases carbon dioxide production and increases hydrogen peroxide production. Um, so putting that strain on your body to have to make more heme is going to be taxing on, on your body as well. And then um, the breakdown of existing heme that's been damaged increases carbon monoxide in the body. And so, of course, that has a half carbon dioxide has a higher binding affinity uh, to heme. And so that's going to decrease your oxygen saturation capacity. So you've got all of those things. And then you've got some other problems that come with it. So um, glycation damage actually damages um, heparin sulfate proteoglycans. And then it increases heparinase, which is an enzyme that breaks down um, heparin sulfate. Um, and so the heparin sulfate is an anticoagulant um, and so you're you're going to get more coagulation and, and coagulability um, as well as again as, as mentioned in the paper um, hyperinsulinemia affects vitamin d it affects vitamin d movement through the body it affects activation uh, one of the things it actually does is that it increases uh, sulfate wastage in the renal system so again if you've got hyperglycemia breaking down heparin sulfate proteoglycans and then you've got sulfate wastage um, obviously you're going to lose more sulfate um, to be able to make these uh, anticoagulants in the body. Um, so there's so many other areas, so many, so many areas of vitamin D working as a, um, as a antimicrobial in terms of producing catholicidins. Another thing that's very interesting is that vitamin D increases the transcription of osteocalcin and the bone cells actually uh, the osteocytes actually activate vitamin D. So this is very interesting um, that we only sort of think about activation of vitamin D inside of the liver and the kidneys, but there are actually many other cells that can activate, um, activate vitamin D. Um, and so I'm trying to think, um, I, again, the thing with hyperinsulinemia is that it causes um, problems for absorbing um, nutrients in the body as well. So with regards to magnesium, zinc, selenium, all of these micronutrients, uh, things that drive hyperinsulinemia also drive a poorer absorption of minerals because the, the kinds of foods that raise the pH of the, of the stomach um, effectively cause precipitation of minerals out of solution. So things that increase stomach pH you know, above three, four, or 
essentially over time make it so that the stomach can't produce a strong acid, which is a below pH two, so ideally pH one, then you're going to end up um, nutrient uh, malnourished in, in many ways, sort of have subclinical malnourishment. And that's not just minerals. It's also, it's pretty much everything really. Um, and the reason being is that the, the strongest um, stimulant of cholecystokinin is stomach acid, and then it's fats and proteins. And so if you don't have a very, very strong stomach acidity, then cholecystokinin isn't produced enough. And it's cholecystokinin that causes the bile to secrete bile acids. And it actually stimulates the liver to produce bile. Um, and then it stimulates pancreas to release its digestive enzymes. And so it's obviously very important to have this cholecystokinin uh, secretion. And with that bile and pancreatic juices is what facilitates the uptake of you know, your fat-soluble vitamins, your essential fatty acids, and uh, even your pancreatic digestive um, enzymes to break down proteins as well. Into, in, well, they're broken down in the stomach, but further broken down into the smallest amino acids inside of the intestines. And so hyperinsulinemia, um, it, it's, it's a vicious cycle because you've got something that can cause hyperinsulinemia, and then hyperinsulinemia obviously sort of perpetuates it even more. Um, and so then you end up with all these deficiencies that then actually feed into causing more hyperinsulinemia, unfortunately. Um, and with regards to um, vitamin D, it, it hyperinsulinemia causes vitamin D to be sequestered into fat cells. So it becomes not available to you. And it, you have this reduction in magnesium uptake as well as magnesium loss through the renal system. And magnesium is required to transport vitamin D around the body. So there's many, many areas. It's not just one area that it, that is, that's a problem is occurring. Um, and the, the effects on the body are quite profound. So you know, you do hear in the news, thankfully, you hear people starting talking about vitamin D, but it's just, it's, it's more upstream. It's more upstream. And this is the problem, I think, as well. And I, I don't disagree that there shouldn't be um, application in hospitals of vitamin D. Absolutely. Um, but what I'm saying is that uh, because you have these other problems as well, you, you know, why is it we see trials maybe aren't so efficacious is because they're not putting vitamin D with magnesium. Um, they're not adding zinc into it because um, the enzymes that require the cholesterol sulfate, the sulfur relation, the heparin sulfate proteoglycans to, to attach those sulfates, that enzyme requires zinc, you know, things like this. And um, obviously higher carbohydrate loads are working against these patients against you essentially and so if you go into hospital and you have enteral feeding or parental feeding you know or just the general hospital food unfortunately um it, it, it's basically cancelling out a, a lot of those efforts and so you, so it makes it it does make it the problem that you get um relatively small trials uh with vitamin d where some turn out and go well it doesn't really work doesn't really make any difference and and these sort of things and because we, we like just like we know enzymes must have their cofactors so it's often the combination of things that will produce the results yeah and that's that's very important to talk about the context which which, the, which these things are done and uh i wanted to just further sort of bring a point there are a number of studies that talk about uh you know not only individual risk factors for morbidity or mortality with with regards to respiratory infections and, and this no one's no different but there's studies out there that show that people that are obese, the people that have metabolic syndrome, uncontrolled diabetes, tend to shed more viral particles. They tend to shed them for longer periods of time. They, shed, they tend to develop more virulent viral particles. So they, in, va in fact, make a pandemic worse. They increase the, the population mortality. So by ignoring that and just saying, hide in your house, watch TV, eat your snacks, or a mask wait for the vaccine, you're actually making the pandemic worse because you're not addressing this vector of people, you know, that, that, that are going to spread more readily, more aggressive variants and stuff like that. So I, I just, you know, I, I just don't think we can <laughs> ignore that any longer. And it's not to say these people are bad, evil people, but we have to address that. I think we have to just as much like I'm driving down the street, looking at my radio, I had a rental car yesterday in Seattle and the rental car literally on the screen, the radio is telling me to cover my nose when I sneeze and wear a mask. And I'm like, that's fine. Where's the message to say, hey, stop eating ultra processed junk food. 
yes. it's not there. Yeah. And, I, and I think we were, we're missing out on a huge opportunity. And I just, I just hate, you know, the, the cynic in me thinks it's just too much conflict of interest. I know you're probably familiar with Grant Schofield out in New Zealand. I know you're working, you've, you've, you've mentioned, because he's, he, he, but, he, well, I think you, you know, Catherine's in, in, in Grant Schofield have, have, have proffered forward that hyperinsulinemia is the root cause of pretty much every chronic disease there is. There's a nice paper from about, I think, 2016 that he wrote. What are your thoughts on, I know this is controversial, but cancer, because I know Becky asked about that. Cancer um, and ketogenic diets, and do they have a role? Could they maybe mitigate or sort of limit your exposure to that? What are your thoughts? So actually it's my main background, cancer. And so that's really what I wrote my, my, my first thesis on um, was, was uh, ketosis and cancer on the, the metabolism of cancer actually. And so um, do I think that just going into ketosis alone is going to resolve uh, some people's cancers? Not necessarily. The degree of cancer, it's complicated and you may need the extra help from treatments. Um, do I also think that though some of the chemotherapies are incredibly carcinogenic? So there's this, you know, double-edged sword in that respect. So you have, really have to think about it. Um, in terms of, uh, with regards to cancer and and restricting carbohydrates and getting into ketosis, um, you know, I think it's a no-brainer when you when you look at uh, what's gone wrong, what's going on inside of the cells. I mean, the can cancer cells, they uh, they, they basically, I mean, obviously it's not going to be necessarily the case for all cancers, but let's, let's definitely say for at least 95% of them, um, they have this metabolic dysregulation and they do, they, they suck up glucose like it's going out of fashion. I mean, it, it's really sort of the premise of the PET scan and then looking at uh, glucose analog uh, uptake into cancer cells and where, so you can diagnose where the cancer is using PET scans and then rate of uptake with the glucose. So that's number one is the glucose aspect. Um, there is another aspect, which is glutamine. I think it's quite underappreciated that glutamine is an issue for cancer as well. But glucose is far up that list. Um, now, the thing is, is that a lot of people can have uh, cancer patients actually could have very nice looking glucose numbers, very nice looking HbA1c and actually not too bad looking insulin either. And so then you look at it and go, well, they obviously don't have this problem. Um, well, the glucose has been sucked up by the cancers, unfortunately. So that's why the glucose numbers look good and the HbA1c can look really good. And this is, again, the problem I'm saying about insulin is that um, there are a few, um, you know, you go on the NHS or you go on the American equivalents, they sort of give you an idea of reference ranges for insulin, but actually um, e even in the so-called reference range, because there really isn't any proper decent sort of range um, that tells you that much. And, and the problem is, is that you can be even middle way to lower down on the sort of common numbers that are seen and it's pathological for you. And that's, therein lies that problem. Um, so the thing is, is that uh, you know, cancer in its most basic level is cells that are continually replicating. They're continually replicating and it's not stopping and they don't die. This is it. And then the next stage from that is they move to other places in your body. And that's usually a, a, a bad, very, very bad situation. Um, and so what fuels the cell? and what signals it to replicate so much. And then the next aspect is with regards to, I, I put inverted in comma, you know, inverted brackets, um, genomic instability. Um, I argue it's a downstream phenomena, and that's because the rate of cellular replication and the decrease in cellular repair mechanisms introduces those genomic changes which then obviously have a consequence further on down the line. But it is why you would see within one person's tumor, when you dissect it, that it's actually quite heterogeneous. It's very different. The gene expressions in it, it's like they come from 10 different people. Um, and so, and what's very interesting, of course, is that you know, all cancers end up behaving the same. I mean, it's very unrandom to behave the same. But anyhow, um, it's kind of logical when you see that cancer cells, is, you know, in a in vitro situation, with regards to growing cancer cells, it requires a high amount of glucose and insulin. It has to have these two, and glutamine if you're looking at metastases aspects. And so to me, it's like quite obvious they'll restrict the glucose and lower the insulin. The insulin is the growth factor signal. And like I said, you won't necessarily see insulin being high in a lot of cancer patients. Instead, you see high IGF-1, uh, high uh, estrogen, you know, you, you see high growth factors um, depending on the region of the body um, and male or female. 
um, patients but those growth factors are working again it's the other aspect that you have higher amount of receptors so the cells become much more sensitive to that smaller dosage and those receptors are in the membrane of the cells because of insulin so this is the thing you really want to be lowering insulin as much as you can lower it. and there are certain things you can't do you can't lower it um, first of all you need it insulin is essential for life um but the other aspect is stress lack of sleep running up the stairs you know a lot of things that will stimulate insulin secretion um even being in ketosis at some point will stimulate insulin secretion um and so basically you kind of don't want to add the glucose on top that's going to stimulate the insulin secretion um and then, uh, you know, at, at the cellular level with regards to mitochondria, if you want to sort of see the sort of the, the nuts and bolts of the cell, um, with regards to cancer, uh, the, the cancer cells, they either have less mitochondria or they have the same amount of mitochondria, but they're, they're completely deformed. They're a different shape. Their morphology is a different shape. They have less of the inner mitochondrial membrane, which is the electron transport chain. Um, and so you, you will hear people argue and say, no, you know, a lot of cancer cells, they have the same amount of mitochondria, but it's like, well, you know, structure and function is a basic principle in, in biology and physiology. And when you measure the mitochondria, you measure how much, um, Cardiolipin is a good example, is the, the fatty acid that's inside of the mitochondria. It, it, it's really sort of a linear relationship um, with how much electron transport chain activity there is. And the less electron transport chain health and activity, then the more tumorous, the more cancer behavior of the cell in itself. Because essentially what, what happens is it shifts the cell to require to get its ATP from substrate level phosphorylation inside of the mitochondria and from glycolysis. And in that case, it would be aerobic um, fermentation. And when those pathways get kicked in because mitochondria has been damaged, because it has less of the inner mitochondrial membrane, when those pathways get kicked in, they then subsequently affect other signaling pathways. So if you upregulate hypoxia inducible factor, which can be from hypoxia, and so this is going to be an issue that I, I, you know, I will put out there with regards to wearing masks is increasing hypoxia. This is definitely not good when we talk about cancer. Um, and you upregulate hypoxia inducible factor and this is going to increase NF kappa beta inside of the cell. So, so it's a mechanism to increase inflammation activation from within the cell rather than a cytokine from the outside to activate inflammation. And all of these will, they feed into the nucleus and they trigger they basically essentially sort of trigger the cell to go through the cell cycle. The, you know, when you think about the, the G phase, the S phase and the my, and mitosis phase, they trigger it to go faster and insulin um, sort of overrides, not overrides everything really. Cause what happens is normally if you have some, some DNA damage, then the cell puts on a pause and it puts on this pause and brings in DNA repair enzymes and that will get fixed up and then you can move on to the next phase of the cell's life. Um, whereas insulin signaling is so strong that it actually can push the cell past that. It overrides it. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, you're driving and you're supposed to slow down at the red light and, you know, your passenger sitting next to you puts their foot on your gas pedal and just charges you through it and you've got no choice. And that's pretty much what happens. And then the, the, the DNA doesn't get fixed. It, it, that gets passed on, unfortunately. Um, and so insulin does all these things. And you even have sort of um, genes that are sort of seen as, as markers um, for, for increased cancers. So where genes where there's a, an, a molecule inside of the cells called AKT is sort of when it's turned on, that's it, it's just turned on. Um, whereas if you, AKT is in a pathway of insulin signaling. And so if you remove that, you, you will diminish that activation of AKT and you'll, you'll bring in other things that will repress AP, ATP, uh, sorry, AKT signaling. Um, and so going into ketosis has, has beneficial effects even for cancers that have links to certain um, genotypes. Um, and so, yeah, I do think that there's, there's a lot of merit to it. But again, it's one of those things where it's not just ketosis because many people are nutrient deprived. They don't have the right nutrients in their body. And so even going into ketosis, if, if a study is just a case of, you know, going in ketosis, you might not necessarily see effects because you need to give the body what it needs to heal. And those are the raw ingredients. So it's a case of in life, it's remove the thing that is making you sick, but give it the things so it can heal itself and fix itself too. 
That's uh, there's a lot in there. <laughs> you know, I, I'm sure you're familiar with work with Thomas Seyfried. He would make you know he makes that same argument. And, you know, I think the most compelling thing to me was when they looked at the individual tumors and they looked at the individual cells and they had they didn't even have the same mutation. So you can't argue it's a somatic mutation if that's a thing. You you would expect every cell to have that, at least the same initial mutation, which it doesn't. Um, one comment in there that you slipped in there that will probably raise some eyebrows is talking about hypoxia from induced from wearing masks and leading to increased inflammation. Are we going to see more cancer cases? And again, that's a very controversial statement. I've seen where the local environment inside the mask is relatively hypoxic. Does it induce a systemic arterial blood glass gas hypoxia that's unknown? You know, perhaps some of the maybe the N95s and so on and so forth. So that's I don't want to. I don't want to get into that right now because it will make a lot of people upset. But anyway, we my battery and my we're at through an hour. My battery's about to die. This has been wonderful, Isabel. Maybe we can get you come back because I think we could just get into one topic because you've got such a breadth of knowledge. And I think I'm sure our folks here would like to sort of delve into one thing because we kind of did a little pot potpourri today or potpourri. How do you say it? Anyway, so it's smorgasbord of topics. So we'll do that again if you're if it's if you're if it's okay with you. Definitely. It was my pleasure. Right. Thank okay. You. Before you go, where do people find you, social media and, and other places so they can, they can look up what you've been up to? Yeah. On uh, Twitter and Facebook. Twitter is um, at I underscore mitochondria and Facebook is Bella Mitochondria. And Bella because my name is Isabella and mitochondria because I'm obsessed with it. Very good. Well, let's talk about mitochondria in more detail next time. I have to run. I've got three nice dry aged steaks that I just got done from 37 days of dry aging. So I'm going to have those for breakfast and <laughs> waiting, waiting on more than a month for this. So I'm excited. My one meal of the day. And so <laughs> anyway, I'll be, I'll be, uh, it's interesting about the measuring the ketones later in the day relative to the morning. Cause I always wake up with, with ketones in the morning. You're right. I do. And then sometimes later in the day may or may not, depending on when I exercise, when I eat, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, Well, if you exercise, stuff. you expect them to drop. You expect your ketones yeah, should drop. Sure, sure. Well, yeah, you use them for fuel, right? I understand yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So. Okay, guys, we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you. And thanks again, Isabel. Have a great uh, evening in the UK. In, oh, in Dubai, rather. Have fun in Dubai. <laughs> see you later. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye now.